we have Malcolm Pai and Mark Plampin, CEO and CFO of Benchmark Holdings. Malcolm co-founded Benchmark in the year 2000 and has led the company's growth and diversification since then. He's over 30 years experience in international agribusiness through roles within the Hillsdown Holdings and HTMF groups, operating in animal breeding, poultry, feed milling and veterinary services. Mark joined Benchmark in 2010 from PKF, where he was a partner and national chairman of the Food Sector Group, with a focus on corporate finance, M&A and strategic development of clients' businesses. With a market cap of around £280 million, Benchmark's a pioneering innovation company operating the aquaculture, agriculture and animal health sectors. Over the last three years, Benchmark's built up an international platform with strong market positions in health, advanced nutrition and in genetics, each centred on the large and growing aquaculture market. The group's now focused on improving profitability through leveraging the global platform, and the latest results, I think, showed that substantial progress is being achieved across all of the group's operations. It's a pleasure to introduce to you Benchmark Holdings CEO and CFO, Malcolm Pye and Mark Plampin. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, okay, I'm going to start by um, doing some background. Um, some familiar faces in the audience, but some who uh, I think we haven't met before. So um, I'm going to cover some of the background first. So beginning with our vision. Um, so we benchmark set out to become the leading global provider um, in aquaculture technology. And in, that, in our case, that means health, genetics, and advanced nutrition. Um, what do we do? Well, we address the major challenges that our producers, that, they, that our customers in the aquaculture industry face. And this means we're focusing on, on technology that improves yield, product quality, and overall, the profitability of our customers. Um, and we bring together technology, particularly biotechnology or biological development, um, to deliver innovative products. Um, that support our producers right throughout the production cycle. Um, giving you a bit of a feel for Benchmark at a glance. Um, today we've grown a lot since we, since we IPO'd back in 2013. Um, last year our revenues were around 140 million. Um, we have more than 1,400 customers around the world operating in more than 70 countries. Um, and we have operations of our own in 26 or so countries around the world. Um, we have developed market leadership um, in our segments. Um, we have a very unique product offering. I'm going to talk a bit more about that as we go through this. Um, based on the application of innovative technology, um, and we also have a long-standing track record um, in the industry. To give you a bit of a feel about our, our history, we started off in 2000. Um, we began by uh, taking over the Oxford University Research Farm um, and starting to link together. We, the backdrop um, in those days was creating sustainable food production. Um, we were kind of early adopters in that arena. Um, so we were trying to create sustainable food production um, really before it became such a big focus as it's become today. Um, and our original objective was to put together top quality science with producers in the food industry. So we began by taking over the research farm in Oxford and we started to build from there and we quite quickly became, developed a major focus in aquaculture because this was the area that humanity needed um, the technology most in. And it was obvious that we were in a world where 70% of the Earth's service was covered with water, and that only produces 2% of the world's food, of man's food, and therefore that was going to have to change, and it's going to have to change in a sustainable way. Um, and so that created a very big opportunity for us, um, and that created our focus. And we developed the three major divisions, partly through acquisition, um, and partly through um, organic growth uh, from there. Um, and we have, over, that, over the period between 2000 and today, um, we've acquired both manufacturing capabilities for things like vaccines and breeding operations. Um, and we've also put together an integrated global distribution and supply network that covers the whole of the global aquaculture scene. Our strategy 
is to take a leadership position, first of all, in aquaculture technology, therefore. We do this by tackling the difficult to solve problems. So these are the areas where technology has the most um, potential to, for our customers. Um, so we are not making Me Too look alike products to what other people maybe are doing. We set out with the unsolved problems and we tackle those first. We're positioning for growth, so we are looking at a sector that has tremendous growth. The, the aquaculture industry has been the fastest growing segment of the food industry for a long time, set to continue that way for a long time into the future as well. And it's made up of a lot of new emerging areas, so species that have never been farmed before. Um, you know, probably the oldest farm species that, is, that, that we're all aware of is salmon, and that, the salmon industry has developed over the last 40 years but a lot of the, the growth in the industry is from new, totally new species, things like seriola and grouper, shrimp, you know, which only been really farmed really at, at significant volumes for the last 20 years. So each of these new product areas, new species, brings with it its own challenges um, and its own opportunities for us. So we're in a fast growing arena with lots of exciting challenges. And of course, by putting these together, we can deliver very attractive returns um, over the medium long term uh, for our shareholders. Our strategy pillars, where we use insight gained from frontline services um, and industry relationships. So we're very well embedded with our industry. We provide our customers with more than just products. We often provide them with services and advice as well. Um, so we have a very close relationship with the customers. We're using IP rich technology. So it's, uh, these are products that have patents um, around them very often. Very often the technology comes from other areas like human, the human pharma technology or developmental genetics in the human scene. Um, we have built and we operate a global network. We're the only major aquaculture technology company that operates right across the aquaculture scene. And we've established from this a very scalable platform. This company has grown dramatically um, you know, we've averaged 30, 40% growth per annum ever since we were founded, but we can continue doing that. This, where we are today, we can be a lot bigger in five years' time. We can be even bigger again in 10 years' time. And we have a very disciplined approach to investment. Our world is an area where, which has pulled in investment to develop the business as it stands today and develop the products. And as we've been doing that, uh, we have been developing the discipline that you need to have behind that. Mark's going to talk a bit about that later. So what do we do? Well, we're in these three key areas, genetics, nutrition, and health. Um, we're a major player in each. Uh, we're number one in aquaculture genetics in the world. We're number one in advanced nutrition in the world. Um, and we're in one of the top five in aquaculture health. So we, are, we have developed strong market-leading positions in each one. Um, and we're a significant player. And in each, each area has a major um, arena, a big arena of potential customers out there. So although advanced nutrition is much bigger than the others, um, the others can grow to a similar size um, and they have an equally large opportunity. Um, one of the key things that we do is that we provide solutions right across the production cycle. So our products begin right at the beginning in terms of breeding and genetics, producing um, new, new genetics that are more efficient from the customer's point of view, go through the hatchery stage. They have these, these genetics produce eggs that are hatched in the hatchery stage. Those are then grown through larval stages in what's called a nursery environment. And then finally, they go out to the big grow out farms where most of the feed goes in and most of the growth takes place to produce the products that we, that we consume. And benchmark, you can see from this, slide provides products right through the cycle. Um, so we provide genetics, we provide early stage nutrition, we provide health products, vaccines and medicines. And we also provide all of the, the uh, technical products that go around that, things like probiotics, water treatments, um, et cetera. Um, so we're an established player in a growth sector with high barriers to entry. We have key competitors in each of our segments. Um, but we are differentiated from all of the others for a number of reasons. First of all, we're the only one that operates in each of the three important technology arenas. So we, we, we cross 
the three key areas, and we combine them. So we produce products very often that combine two or more of those disciplines. Secondly, we have very special customer relationships. As I said before, we provide services and advice to our customers, so we have a depth of understanding of their business and a stronger relationship. Very often, our relationships go back decades. Um, Often we were there in the hatchery when they were first learning how to farm these animals that today their business is built from. Um, And we have deep technical support. We provide very deep technical support And again, because we cross the three disciplines, we can often bring support from one area to help a customer in another. So we have a very special relationship with our customers. That's our first point of differentiation. Second is there are big barriers to competition. Uh, IP obviously is one. Um, So for example, our salmon breeding program began more than 30 years ago. If you wanted to start breeding modern salmon with all the disease resistance and and production efficiency that our, that our products provide, it would take you 30 years to catch up with where we are today uh, or something like. And so that is a very big barrier to entry for, for potential competitors. We also have um, access to some of the key drivers in the space. So for example, we own the rights, we are, have the rights to harvest on the Great Salt Lake to harvest Artemia, which is the first stage live feed for a whole plethora of aquaculture species. Now, we are one of two organizations that have those rights. um, And if you want to enter those markets, it's a huge advantage to have the highest quality Artemia in in your product profile. We also have very, very high quality manufacturing and production facilities, and they're accredited to the highest standards. So our vaccine plants and our medicine plants are GMP accredited. Again, this is very hard to achieve. Um, The standards in animal health are almost identical to those that apply in human health. So it's a big barrier to entry. We have a tremendous footprint. We have the single best route to market of anyone in aquaculture technology. Um, And we use all of these components together with our trusted relationship with customers to drive our business growth. We also have a pipeline of new products in development. Um, And I'm not going to go into all the detail here, but you can see from the chart here on the right that many of these uh, products in development have the potential to deliver huge value in terms of growing the business, growing margins. These are high margin products that we've been developing and that we've been using the money we raised through the IPO to fuel the development of these products. And many of these are starting to come through to market now. In terms of looking at our history of delivering from our pipeline, Um, This really began back in 2010 when we launched the first new sea lice treatment product, a product called Salmasan. Um, But since then, since 2009-10, we've had a history of launching new products from our pipeline. Um, And this is an increasing number of new products coming out of the pipeline. Some of these have come from our genetics division, things like the uh, Genomics ISA, the Genomics SRS product. These are products that convey disease resistance to producers. Um, they've been tremendously successful launches. We also have new products like Phylovive, the first algal feed for shrimp that was launched in 2015. That's an advanced nutrition product. Um, and coming in the um, health sector, we have some exciting and potentially very important new products like the first nodovirus vaccine. Nodovirus infects a great number of marine finfish species um, and is the limiting factor on their production. Or an, another new generation sea lice treatment the product that we currently have in field trials. Um, so the pipeline has been increasingly delivering new products and new innovative technologies to our customers. If we look at that in a little bit more detail, Ectosan, the new sea lice treatment, is showing 100% efficacy in trials. No one's ever seen that good efficacy before. Um, and so you know, this is causing great excitement in the salmon industry where sea lice is the major disease issue that they face. Um, Our ISA and lice resistant eggs in our salmon genetics division completely sold out for years in front. So customers want these products and they're willing to place orders for two, three years in advance to make sure that they get them. We have been part of the development of the lump fish program or um, cleaner fish program. Some of you may have seen 
articles about this in the newspapers or things on the TV about that. It's a way of using biological control to, to prevent sea lice. Um, we played a key part in that, um, and that's now being implemented commercially in the field. Um, another um, important area for us is the development of the emerging species, things like tilapia and shrimp. Um, and here we have genetics programs and new products coming through, which again are starting to demonstrate powerful benefits for our customers. Um, and we are also launching new um, developments in the advanced nutrition space. The development of new probiotics and immune stimulants is a key area for the food industry. We want these are used to replace antibiotic use in food animals, so it's a really important area. We've been leading that development in aquaculture. Mark's going to talk a little bit about financial results. Okay, um, so our most recent results to 30th September 2017 were published in uh, at the end of January, uh, but we thought we'd give you a quick run through of those so you get a flavour of the financial dynamics, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that might look going forwards. Um, first of all, just a few uh, results highlights, um, both financial and operational. Um, just to mention, the 140 million revenue was a 28% increase on the prior year, and our adjusted EBITDA was up 9% on FY16. Uh, we saw good EBITDA margins in our two um, most sizable divisions around the 20% mark. Um, and we also, during the year, strengthen our board and our management team. We recognise that we've grown significantly since IPO, uh, and we'd reached the stage in our development where we felt we wanted to strengthen the board and also to add some further capability to our management team, which it actually is uh, the uh, most recognised uh, management team in aquaculture in terms of strength and depth of experience globally. Um, Malcolm's talked about the new products, uh, so I won't mention those, but um, just to say that we continued in a phase of investment in FY17. Uh, that has been the case since IPO at the end of 2013. Uh, and during the year, we made uh, significant strides forward in expanding our manufacturing capacity, both in genetics uh, and in health. Uh, and we also continued that investment in R&D. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a moment. So just to give you a bit more flavour uh, of the group's results for FY17, um, here we talk about revenue and that 28% growth. Uh, if we look at the bar chart on the bottom right, then we can see how that's broken out divisionally. Um, and if we look at genetics, we see a £9.8 million growth year on year. Uh, that represents about 47% increase. Uh, and this came principally from our salmon genetics business, uh, which today is about 95% of that division's turnover. Uh, that growth was driven by an increase in the number of units sold, um, and more importantly, an increase in the average price per unit. Uh, as we're able to demonstrate to our customers uh, the value of improved genetic traits that we launch, they can see that that adds to their bottom line and they're willing to pay us more per unit for that product. Um, our animal health division, uh, the uh, 9.7 reduction that you see there, um, related largely to SAMSAM, which is a mature product. Um, that's um, something that we've been very clear about since IPO. It's a product that has gone past its patent protection and has seen some competition in markets. It's now, during the FY17 year, reduced to 5 million of revenue, so a relatively small proportion of benchmark today. Uh, we expect its sales to tail off uh, over the coming five years or so, uh, but still an important uh, product in that sea lice market. And it shows the position that we have in that market for new products coming through um, that tackle the same problem, like Ectosan and Clean Treat, that we just began field trials in the first half of this year for. Um, there, the uh, reduction in uh, turnover was 39%. And then our largest division today, Advanced Nutrition, saw good growth year on year. Uh, we acquired the majority of that business in the 2016 year, part way through. So if we adjust that and look at it on a like-for-like -like basis, uh, we see growth for that division in revenue uh, year on year of 21%. So still a good growth um, resulting from that adjustment. And on a group basis, if we make the same like-for-like -like adjustment, revenue growth of 13%. So organically, a good revenue growth result. If we then turn to profitability, 
uh, as I mentioned, adjusted EBITDA up by 9%. Um, here we did see uh, an impact of that a reduction in revenue in the animal health division. Um, however, we were very pleased with the EBITDA margin performance of our genetics division, um, contribute or delivering a margin on revenue of 19%, which is significantly up from the prior year, which was sub 10%, um, driven by that uh, revenue growth that I mentioned earlier. And in advanced nutrition, a 21% EBITDA margin. Uh, and these EBITDA margins are quite indicative of uh, the capability for the future for this group as a whole. Um, we also saw um, like for like adjusted EBITDA at around 10 million, um, adjusting for the acquisition we made in FY16 that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is roughly approximately the same as the prior year. Uh, although in FY17, we did incur a uh, an exceptional bad debt uh, of around 1.2 million. So if we add that back, we did in fact see growth on the like for like adjusted EBITDA of around 10%. And an adjusted profit before tax of 6.3 million up from 5.2 in the prior period. If I turn then to the balance sheet and our funding, um, here we did see as predicted a move in FY17 to a net debt position. Uh, we closed out the year with 23.9 million of net debt. That's as a result of the investment that I mentioned earlier. So here we saw a free cash flow outflow of 21 million. Um, that's a combination of 16 million inflow from operations and 31 million of investment uh, capex. So we have been busy investing in both production capacity uh, where we concluded during the year the final phase of development of our vaccine manufacturing facility in Braintree in Essex. And also we were at the end of this financial year approximately halfway through building a new salmon egg breeding facility in Norway. That will conclude at the end of this FY18 financial year. Um, and we invested on a capitalised basis two million in R&D. Our total investment in R&D in the year uh, was around 15 million. So clearly we have expensed R&D and capitalised R&D. Um, we are compelled to capitalise R&D at the point at which a product is beyond technical feasibility, um, which largely applies to around the last 20% of the R&D pathway of any product um, before it reaches market. So this will be a continuing feature of the business as more new products now come through to market, as Malcolm mentioned. Um, the liquidity position of the business at the end of September last year was around 35 million of headroom um, and we continue to see investment in this year which I'll uh, talk to you about in a moment. Uh, and then from a leverage perspective, uh, this is one of our key financial covenants. We have a revolving credit facility uh, which is our main funding uh, line for the group uh, which includes a leverage covenant of three times net debt to adjusted EBITDA. At the year end, it was around 1.8 times, uh, so sufficient headroom in that facility uh, to give us good confidence looking forwards in terms of the investments that we have uh, to fund from our cash flow and facilities. I'll turn now to talk a little bit about uh, the numbers looking forward from here. Um, first of all, looking at things from a more operational perspective, uh, what we see and are confident in is continued growth across the divisions. Um, this in genetics will be delivered uh, through continuing growth in our market share in the important salmon market. As I said, that's the majority of our genetics business today. Um, but then also importantly, seeing our moves into other major production species, shrimp and then tilapia, starting to show good contribution on the revenue growth. Um, the shrimp genetics business uh, has a target of penetrating the um, most significant Asian shrimp market. And here we have a very strong synergy with our advanced nutrition business, uh, who are the market leader in that Asian market for shrimp production in that early stage hatchery segment. Um, and also tilapia um, is a significant focus for us in terms of uh, opening up those um, South American and Asian markets, uh, also through synergies that we have with other parts of the business. In nutrition, um, Malcolm mentioned Artemia being one of the key staple products there. 
And um, we have uh, today the strongest position globally, as you mentioned. Uh, that's a natural resource which um, will not expand any further in terms of its output. And our clear focus is on what we call replacement diets. Um, these are man-made diets that replace out that live feed. Uh, and here, uh, these are higher margin products. And clearly, as we see the mix of our revenue swing more towards those products by selling them into the same customer base that we have and also expanding our position in the existing markets, then we can see good uh, ongoing contribution uh, to that growth target. Um, we also see the opportunity to expand further into the um, nursery market uh, with products like probiotics that Man Malcolm mentioned earlier, which are key um, drivers of improved performance for that next stage in the grow out, grow out of aquaculture species. Uh, and China is an important focus for us looking forward. Today, it's a very small proportion of the group's revenue, um, sub 5%, um, but clearly um, the largest market in the Asian region. And if we can find the right approach to that with the risks in mind, then that's something that we're looking at closely. From a health perspective, here the future driver of revenue and profitability is very much around the pipeline of new products. Uh, and we have had the success of the beginnings of field trials for Ectosan and Clean Treat. Uh, and we expect that to continue to roll out this year and over the next couple of years as we then move to the full licensing for that product, which will really open up the whole uh, market for us. Uh, we're also seeing an increasing number of products come out through our vaccine portfolio. Uh, and we're beginning there with products in Seabass and Seabream uh, during this financial year. Um, and tilapia and, of course, salmon remain important targets for us for that growth. From a financial perspective, um, what I've just told you operationally hopefully gives you a flavour for how the top line will be driven. Um, here we see the opportunity to gain operating leverage uh, with the infrastructure that we have in place already. Uh, and therefore, if we look at the bottom of this page in bold, the final bullet for each division, you can see the guidance that we're giving for um, adjusted EBITDA in the long term, which we define to be three to five years out. Um, we uh, expect to see solid growth continuing within the genetics division, taking us through to a mid-20s uh, percent adjusted EBITDA. Um, and we can see that that division has the cash flow profile to fund its ongoing capex and R&D needs. In nutrition, uh, already achieving a 21% EBITDA margin. Here again, we anticipate mid to long term, mid 20s percentage EBITDA margin. And again, that division will continue to fund its own capex and R&D requirements. Uh, in the short to mid term, the health division will continue to rely on the former two divisions in order to fund its investment phase in R&D. Um, but then with the increasing number of products coming through, the top line growth and operational, operational leverage, bearing in mind these are products that are largely focused on unmet needs for our customers, then we have good visibility of significant growth in our EBITDA margins for this division. And again, in the long term, we see those climbing to the mid 20%. And then I thought I'd just talk for a minute about financial discipline. Malcolm mentioned that earlier. It's very important to us as a growth company in an investment phase. Um, our leverage and headroom, uh, I touched on earlier, but just to say for this year, um, we can see a peak in our leverage as we continue to invest uh, in production facilities and R&D of around two and a half times. Um, we have uh, an absolute uh, requirement to maintain through our rolling forecasts a minimum 10 million pounds of uh, headroom in liquidity terms. Uh, we apply strong cost and capital discipline. I'll talk you through that in a moment. Um, and we will apply our long-term positive uh, cash flow to paying down the debt. Uh, and for us, a steady state covenant on the leverage would be something in the range of one and a half to two times in the long term. We, of course, see it's sensible to have some gearing in the business in order to um, give our shareholders better returns. From a capital allocation point of view, we have a detailed process uh, which begins with a proposal from the division, the relevant division, uh, which must be based, as you'd expect, uh, on a business case that includes strategic, commercial and financial measures. Uh, here, from a financial point of view, uh, we'll see a full model, a financial model built. 
that shows the life of the project and converts to a discounted cash flow from that. We'll, of course, look at various um, hurdles in terms of returns, but principally on uh, IRR and return on cumulative invested capital. Our base threshold is our weighted average cost of capital, which was uh, just under 10% in the last financial year. And, of course, we will look then at each project proposal on a case-by-case -case basis to look to risk weight the threshold for returns. Um, and historically, we have seen typical hurdle rates that projects have had to meet and exceed of between 14 and 20%. Uh, and increasingly, we're making use of joint ventures to allow us to progress with our expansion more quickly. Uh, this is a model that we find allows us to leverage our partners' position in certain key markets and one that we've applied already very successfully in salmon breeding. Uh, and it's possible we may move to use that model in other species as well. Malcolm, Outlook. Uh, so we're a diversified group um, and we have leading market positions in high growth markets. We already have two of our three major divisions performing well. Um, as Mark said, we, we can see those continuing to improve their, their margins, but they're already performing well, generating cash um, and um, high EBITDA returns. And the third one will reach that point fairly soon as we bring through the new products that are coming through the, from our pipeline now. The short-term um, funding requirements, the CapEx and R&D requirements, are funded from group cash generation and from facilities that we already have in place. Um, and we also have, right now, a review of non-core activities ongoing. So as we've grown, sometimes through acquisition, we picked up odd bits and pieces that aren't absolutely core to our main mission in building our position in aquaculture technology. And we're starting to review the best ways to, to uh, generate value from some of those. We have a a review ongoing at the moment on that area. We have strong cost and capital discipline. We control costs very tightly. Um, you know, we're very much aware that uh, as we've been going through this phase of investment, it's important to keep a tight control on costs and on capital itself, as Mark has, has said. Um, and we expect that we're quite close to our peak capex. That's going to be here over the next 12 months. And then we'll come into an era where we see the cash flows paying down the, the borrowing and, um, and exceeding the capex requirement um, substantially. Um, we expect that we will continue to grow at our current rate um, and we have the production capacity by and large which will allow us to do that without massive um, input of more capital. Um, so that will drive operational leverage. Um, and we see a period of long-term cash generation coming that will deliver exciting returns for our shareholders um, whilst we are able to continue to invest in further organic growth. So we see a very positive outlook for the future looking forward from where we are. That is pretty much um, all we wanted to say, so let's, um, let's take questions. The business sounds really interesting. The growth barriers to entry sound really interesting. You said a lot about EBITDA and adjusted profits. Can you say something about the outlook for real profits, bottom line, non-adjusted, real EPS and free cash flow? Um, yeah, so um, that R&D investment that we're making obviously has an impact on the real profits at the bottom line, as you mentioned, uh, and also the fact that we've been in acquisition mode for almost four years means there are significant value of intangible assets that of course get amortized through. Um, so you, you have to take that into account when you look at the net loss. Um, we anticipate moving through to the point of break even at that level um, around the turn of FY19 and if, into FY20 uh, as a result of the top line growth that I mentioned earlier. Uh, from a cash perspective, then we continue to be in investment mode in this year. Uh, our capex will probably be around the level of £25 million. Uh, and that means, of course, there'll be an outflow of cash because at the same time, we'll have an increase in investment in working capital. With effect from FY19, that capex will reduce significantly, uh, probably to something like £12 to £15 million. Uh, and the year after that, it may reduce again a little further. So we can see that we have then the opportunity with the top line growth and the increase in EBITDA that I mentioned, 
to move into a cash positive position. And again, we expect to see that around, um, well, broadly neutral during FY19 and moving into positive cash flow, free cash flow generation in FY20 and beyond. Hello, yes. Can you just talk a bit about how you see any future regulation of dramatically modified fish developing and how that might impact your business? Um, yep. Um, we expect that the... Uh, well, well, first of all, we don't think that, that true GMOs, true genetically modified, um, in the sense of taking gen genes from one organism and putting them into another, is going to be a, a, a feature of our world. We, we can make progress more rapidly with, with more conventional techniques or with more um, surgically precise techniques than, than that. So the GMO story isn't going to be a major feature in our world. However, some of the tools like gene editing um, and using things like stem cell uh, programs um, will have applications in our world. That's, that's how we see it, both in terms of the animals that we're producing, so editing their genes to make them resistant to disease or, or that kind of uh, process, or maybe even the, um, uh, the development of exciting new vaccine technologies that's already widely used in the human arena. Um, mm -hmm. And we expect to see more of that coming along. It's, hap it's happening already in, in the food animals. We expect to see more of that coming along in the future. In terms of regulation, to answer your question, we expect that it will be regulated in a way that's very similar to the way in which medicines are regulated. So there will be you know, safety, efficacy requirements, environmental um, impact requirements that need to be met. Um, so we are expecting that there will be some level of regulatory control probably quite similar to what we already face when we're producing new animal health products. On a global scale, um, who's competing with you? Because always this business has been acquiring, what well, you said for the last four years, you've been buying businesses. I'm just wondering to what extent that's absolutely necessary um, as compared to the business focusing and generating cash. Yeah, um, so... Uh, two, two elements to that question. So the first one is who's competing with us? Well, we face competition in each of our segments. Um, we are quite a strong player. So if you take genetics, we have one major competitor, which is a company called Aquagen, privately owned German company, EWG, or Eric West Johan Group. Um, and um, we are number one, they're number two. We're very, actually very, very close in terms of market share and size. Um, there isn't too many other significant players. There's some smaller players in different segments. So the shrimp segment has got some other players. Tilapia segment has got a plethora of other players. But in terms of major competitors, it's, it's basically us and Aquagen. Um, in the advanced nutrition space, some of the familiar names, companies like Nutreco are there and Cargill. Um, but to be honest, we are a lot, easily the largest player in that space in aquaculture. Um, and we face a plethora of small regional players who supply some part of the product offering. Um, and um, we expect that competition will continue to, to feature as part of, of what we do, but you know, we're, we're in quite a, a strong position in those markets. In the health sector, the major animal health companies tend to be our competitors. So Zoetis are there, um, Elanco are there, um, Merck are there, those are the three majors. Um, and um, it's quite a specialized area. And today it's a small area, although they mostly recognize that aquaculture will ultimately be the largest area um, in animal health, but that's gonna take some time to, to fully mature. Um, and so these companies are, you know, in some sense, they, it's a small part of their portfolio and their focus isn't as tight on that areas ours is so even though these are very big companies with tremendous resources we don't feel that we're in a competitively disadvantaged situation um, today um, in terms of acquisitions the sort of second half of your question um, we really have we we had to make some acquisitions to build the platform um, that we have today um, and some of these companies have been built over 30 40 years um, and for us to uh, climb into those segments to get in and take a, a strong position in those segments was would have been very hard for us to do without without acquisition and but we have gone through that phase of acquisition we made the last significant acquisition almost two years ago now um, and so we've 
we're in a we're at a time where it's really all about organic growth. And the answer to your question is, you know, which is is probably no, it's not really necessary for us to continue to make significant acquisitions. There will there is a little rider there which which says there will always be opportunities to acquire exciting new technologies or maybe a starting point or an interesting position in a relatively new market for us. You know, some of these markets are emerging very rapidly. Um, but by and large, we have completed the the acquisition phase, which built the platform that, that, that gives us all this opportunity for the future. That's great. Um, I think we're going to have to call it at time there. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Very impressive. Um, any further questions, take at the end. Thank you.